Hello? <laughs> oh, wow. How is everyone? Very good. Well, so um, here we are with our mics and our chartreuse chairs and, and <laughs> our... Uh, well, let's do this. So um, this is the meaning stage, which is interesting because it's that one, right? That's the money stage. And I'm not quite sure, sort of like, what is the, is the, we need a metaphor for the body of water in between or something like that. Um, thank you very much for coming. This panel uh, came out of um, a talk that I did last year, uh, talking about vibrant communities. And um, one of the things that I wondered about out loud when I talked last year was, what does it look like? How do you make them? How do you build them? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about, is people who have real experience inside of vibrant communities. And those are the people that you see in front of you and the names you see on the screen. So myself, I'm working with an organization called the Resilience Exchange. We're working to help very large NGOs share their solutions internally so that they can iterate against them but simultaneously share those solutions across the sector so that Oxfam and Mercy Corps and GIZ, organizations like this can share with each other and we can improve what we know over time. Uh, Andrea Armeni from Transform Finance will be talking roughly from an investor's perspective. Sean Murphy, Fund Good Jobs, will be talking roughly from the perspective of an entrepreneur or enterprise. And Lisa Sharon Harper, of Sojourners, we'll be talking from the perspective of the community. But the reality is that while we like to think about ourselves in really monolithic terms, with money on the top, and then business, and then the consumer, the reality is that our world looks much more like a network. And that all of us invest all day long when we buy cereal or from the farmer's market or whatever it is we do. All of us are enterprising. All of us are consumers and community members. And it's that type of intermixing that is going to get us to the place where we need to do when we bring our humanity into our economy. So let's start with some definitions. Um, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes and then I'm going to hand off. But I want to start with some definitions of what is community, specifically when we talk about it in this context. Community is a very broad term. So in this context, and this could be wrong, and that would be fine, let us know. Let me know. Um, I impose this on these guys too. So community is a network of humans necessarily connected by both social and economic activity. That's the context that we're talking about community in this session. So what that means is that Ferguson is a community. What that means is that SOCAP 14 maybe isn't. Maybe it's more an affinity group. I don't know. How about an investment fund? Depends on how those, those fundees interact to, with each other, whether or not they're part of the same physical community, I don't know. But the idea is that you have an interchange, a social and economic interchange through a group of people. Vibrancy, maybe the more interesting term. It's a measure of the health of a community specifically concerned with the unfettered movement of value. So the nice thing about vibrancy is it's been studied in a whole lot of contexts. Without going into those, I'd like to say that these are indicators of vibrancy that I've pulled out of several different studies, and I'd be happy to show, you, to show you some of those studies. But poverty rate, employment rates, employment security, uh, social capital, meaning uh, often usually meaning religious institutions, a faith life, um, connection to spiritual community, racial integration, uh, quality of education, these sorts of things are all indicators that are people using to look at vibrancy. So we're talking about a very rigorous definition of vibrant communities, all right? It's not a generic term, it means a thing. Community and vibrancy. So just as we look to the ledger for profit as evidence of success, we must learn to look to our communities for vibrancy as evidence of success. So this sets up this classic dichotomy that we see in this space all the time, profit and impact. One of the very interesting things that happened in our discussions as we were talking about this panel is that we realized that it's not a dichotomy. It's not what uh, Jed Emerson rails against his bifurcated thinking, but the reality is that we use profit. It's a tool. 
We use profit in order <clears throat> to create vibrancy. And this, these are they, they have a necessary relationship to each other. So now I'd like to hand off to uh, Andrea Armeni to talk about, and this is a question I'm going to, all three of these guys are going to address in the context of um, addressing, their talking to us about their work. How do you use money as a tool to ignite vibrancy in the communities where you work? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on this panel, especially because it's rare that we get a chance to talk at this high conceptual level and not just with respect to very specific tools. Oh, what kind of investment structure should we use? Which becomes relevant to this, uh, to this question as well. I, the work that we do at uh, Transform Finance um, really is at the core of this question for us because we try to bring a social justice approach to impact investing and to social entrepreneurship. We try to see how communities can be engaged more deeply and how value can be created for the, for the communities as opposed to for the investors. So using money as a tool to ignite vibrancy is really for us one of the most fundamental dichotomies that you still see in impact investing and social enterprise or social entrepreneurship. And I'll use the terms loosely since we're here at SOCAP. We all know sort of what we mean. Um, so there are a couple of ways that you see this playing out. One is uh, viewing social problems community issues, uh, especially with historically underserved communities, as a market opportunity, right? Nobody has opened a supermarket in that area. Well, there is some wealth that I can capture there. And we try to flip that around in terms of uh, igniting vibrancy in these communities by saying, well, no, actually, a social problem should not be one of the uh, inputs for profit, right? You shouldn't have capital management. Oh, and we need a problem. Let's go find a problem out there that we can address and make money off of. It's quite the opposite. It's you have a social problem, you have a social change that you would like to see, and you say, well, what tools do I have at my disposal? I have advocacy, I have political action, I can protest in some cases, put up barricades, or you know what? There are some problems that can actually be better solved through the use of the market. So. Mm -hmm. This really flips it around. It becomes. And so is that, is that what you mean by when you, by a social justice approach to impact investing? Because the first time you said that to me, that stood out to me. I've never heard those used in the same sentence before. So this is one of the elements of a social justice approach, and let's call this like the the hard version. So the hard version is capital is a tool for social justice, okay. right? Capital is something that social justice leaders can use in order to address some of their problems, particularly when they can't be addressed in other ways. So for example, if in your community there is a food desert, right, you could yeah. argue for new legislation <laughs> that mandates that for every liquor store there has to be a fruit stand or something like that. Or you could say, you know what, let's take this in our hands in the way that the Got People's it. Grocery yep. did in Oakland and try to open a supermarket that serves the needs of our community, right? This is a, a use of the market, a use of economic forces in in order to solve the problem. Very different from somebody saying from the outside, oh look, there's an underserved market there, we can make money off of that underserved market, right? Um, a big element of that, let me see where the, um, uh, a big element of that for us is really where does that value ultimately reside? For the community to become vibrant, to remain vibrant, more value has to remain in the community than is taken out by the investors in form and of so return. So you're using the term vibrant and not the term, or excuse me, value and not the term profit. Are you differentiating those? Uh, in a sense, yes. If we want to get into the, into the, the thick of it, and I yeah. will, uh, <laughs> exactly I will move be. it to the, to the <laughs> next slide. We believe that a lot of uh, the initiatives, both around impact investing and, uh, and social entrepreneurship, are largely palliative. Let's create some jobs, let's sell uh, more stuff at cheaper prices to poorer people, let's create this kind of incremental changes. But yep. there is a big potential here for something more transformative. And that transformation has a lot to do with the creation of locally owned assets in communities. So if you have a low income job and you get two bucks more, chances are per hour, chances are you will remain in a cycle of poverty. If you start becoming the owner of your work through worker, uh, through worker owned cooperatives, for example, well then your relationship to the work changes a lot. And, uh, and we see a 
positive movement in that direction now, fortunately, where people are starting to be a, a lot more intentional about, okay, what is the ultimate result here? Is it a bunch of people making two bucks more per hour than they were making before, or are they really having governance over their work and building assets through their work? And with the slide that passed by before, I will go back to uh, one of the comments that you made earlier, I don't know how much time I have, which is redefining impact for us is important. Who is it that gets to define impact in impact investing? Who is it that gets to define the social in social entrepreneurship? Should it be the entrepreneurs themselves? Should it be the investors themselves? Well, in our case, the community that is ostensibly affected by this, the community where you're trying to solve a problem, yeah should have a voice in what impact means to them as opposed to having the definition coming in from the, from the outside, which is a very important part where we have to divide between, oh, there's a profit here and there's the social value here, Got it. particularly yep. in, the, in the light. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. So let's uh, move to Sean Murphy, who's going to talk <coughs> about enterprise and business and maybe take a little bit off the glow of the fanciness of social enterprise and just talk about good old-fashioned work. Sounds good. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for having us here today. Um, I'm representing Fun Good Jobs. We're a new 501c3 investment vehicle based out of Oakland, California. We were founded out of an organization called Inner City Advisors, another 501c3 that's done a lot of great work over the years supporting small businesses. Uh, our name is our mission statement. Fun Good Jobs is a very focused uh, mission statement for us, and our theme is around betting on good job creators. Uh, one of them is here today, Conda Mason, who uh, really represents the DNA of what we mean when we talk about good job creators. We bet on people like a lot of investors do, uh, but we have to bet on entrepreneurs that are fully bought into the idea of creating good jobs. Um, in order to do that, how do I do, how do I? Uh, green. Green button. Green is go. go. Okay. Um, in order to do that, we have to define uh, what, our, what our focus of impact is. And I think similar to what uh, we just heard, we have a definition for our stakeholders that matter to our, our funders. Um, and, and that starts with accessible jobs, quality in terms of uh, livable wages, benefits, and life ladders. Um, but what we've also learned is that our entrepreneurs have their own definition. Um, our community has its own definition. So we are intentionally provocative when we say fund good jobs because we want for people to really understand that. Um, and I, as I mentioned, you know, we're here representing the business community because our work got started out of the business community. We didn't uh, decide to just start another fund. Uh, we got started uh, really because the work at Inner City Advisors had led us to a particular gap of capital for businesses. Um, a lot of the discussions here today and this week are around impact capital. A lot of the entrepreneurs we deal with in the street and the community um, in Oakland and throughout the Bay Area don't have access to that kind of capital. Um, even with how far this, this sector has gone, uh, we've really learned that, you know, there's a lot of uh, dollars moving towards the, the microfinance world um, but and, and also seed finance uh, for folks to get started, but not for the established businesses that are scaling. Um, and we use capital as a tool knowing that there's things that need to be done differently uh, in order for that to happen. So practically, we identify those funding needs. We partner with other uh, banks, capital providers, and we provide the most catalytic form of capital tailor it so we can have other uh, funders come to the table and, and, and therefore leverage more capital for the entrepreneurs. Uh, we track that and we measure it ongoing with our engagement uh, and partnership with inner city advisors and we make sure that good jobs are always a part of the conversation. Uh, businesses that we work with are already uh, thinking this way in a lot of ways. Uh, they're not necessarily on the cover of, of your magazines and, and kind of the, the new tech stories you hear here in the Bay Area, uh, but they are folks from Impact Hub Oakland that are starting these businesses. There are folks in East Oakland that are creating good jobs, um, but not necessarily the, the next tech story. This is a quick shout out to sort of where we focus our capital. So the greatest need that we see is between 100000 and $2 million. Uh, most of the banks uh, these days are uh, not doing things below $2 million. And so what we end up doing is providing a convertible note uh, and or subordinate debt to allow the bank to see a stronger balance sheet for some of the businesses we work with. Um, and, and therefore, capital is truly a tool because we're, we're giving up a lot on the return and maybe putting up more risk and, and maybe putting up more capital. Um, but we're, we're using our, our ecosystem to further support that. Is so that specifically what you mean by catalytic capital? You put some money in and you come in with a bank and they add to it. Absolutely. So we, we typically will not do a deal if a bank will do it. We're not here to compete uh, with the traditional system. We want to know and we partner with our banks that we have relationships with. We want to know that our capital is going to move another dollar or two to the business. 
so if there's a total need of a million dollars and we can talk to a bank about providing 500,000 in, in a subordinate form, uh, the bank will be more interested to do something. Uh, and that, that, that is the case for private equity funds as well. Um, what we've learned is capital is a tool, but it's only as powerful as the rest of the capital and, and really the interdependencies around uh, the capital that you're facilitating. So we tend to source alongside that. Um, and, and I think the way we do that is different. We, we were for, founded out of an organization called Inner City Advisors, and we move with an ecosystem approach. So for us, we take our deal flow uh, through the proven work of Inner City Advisors and particularly education services provided by Michael Bush and others here that have been working with small businesses over the years. And we are able to bet on proven businesses. More importantly, as they grow, they're able to partner with ICA's talent management program, which means that we're bridging the actual uh, access of jobs and quality of jobs for folks who may have uh, what are traditionally called barriers to employment, but what we view as uh, talent that is just underutilized. And this is our, our approach to, to really moving that forward. Our, our advisory service is really where tool, our tools become more of a toolkit. What we learned over the years is that capital is only as powerful as the support in the network that you provide with it. So we are not only leveraging more capital for these, for these businesses, but we're actually providing an ecosystem of pro bono advisory services, professional services, and making sure that capital is something that is fully supported for the entrepreneurs that we're working with. What does that mean, the capital is fully supported? So what, what, specifically, what kind of TA are you giving? I'm guessing that some of your entrepreneurs don't know what catalytic capital means. They don't. And so, What's that relationship look like, the advisor relationship? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing is uh, being prepared for capital. And that, that, that happens in a lot of different ways. The readiness to go to a bank or to a funder starts with your, you know, not just your financial statements per se, but your forecasting and your strategic planning and the, the very practical needs that um, can be a soundboard and or the actual execution for an entrepreneur to, to excel their, their position. And then on an ongoing basis, we want to make sure that we're not representing what a business may uh, need to provide in a retro basis or a report per se. We always yeah. want to be a few steps ahead okay. um, in providing that context there. Uh, this last slide is just a, a very clear intention for us that uh, we're, an, we're a nonprofit for a reason. We really want to make sure that uh, for us, profit means progress. And so we, we track profit and we know uh, how important it is to, to make money to sustain things. But Making money is the easiest part of this equation, and so the, the, we really are truly driving an internal rate of return and want all of our money to go back into our fund, um, and that's how we partner with folks uh, to do that. Um, I, I think in terms of the, the community we're talking about here, entrepreneurs, um, a lot of these entrepreneurs are frankly innovating faster than the capital sources at the table. So you have people who are determined, creative, ever optimistic, solving without uh, the help of capital more, more of times than not. So uh, we really realize that, uh, you know, we have to get behind these entrepreneurs and really bring their voice to the table. Got it. Thank you. Wow. So, well, my name is Lisa Sharon Harper, and I am the Senior Director of Mobilizing at Sojourners. Sojourners is about 43 years old this year. Um, we've been around uh, since 1971, and we began in the context of the, civil, the end of the civil rights movement, uh, the beginning of the women's uh, liberation movement, the middle of the Vietnam War era, and we were people of faith. And so actually that's the community really that, that I represent here on this panel is a faith perspective of what does it take to create a vibrant community. Um, Jim Wallace sends his greetings. Uh, he loves SoCap, woohoo. Um, and, uh, and, and so what I want to actually share with you, I want to share first, um, I was on a radio station uh, a couple of years back at the height of the Occupy movement. And the radio station was in Australia. Hello, somebody. And um, in Australia, they were talking about Occupy Wall Street. And they, they had me on, um, along with a lot of different theologians, who we were all just talking about. What, what's going on here? What is this that like the golden calf had entered into the, the Wall Street area? I, I think that week and everybody was talking about the golden calf and the symbolism that that held in terms of faith. And one of the theologians on the, on the, on the show talked about Adam Smith and he talked about Adam Smith in a way that I had never heard before. He said, you cannot understand Adam Smith without understanding his context. That Adam Smith existed within a context that was 100% permeated with Calvinist thought and understanding. He was a Calvinist. And what that means, all that that means, 
actually, you cannot extricate him from that. So when Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand of the market, actually he didn't, he talked about the invisible hand of God, he was talking about the invisible hand of God who then moves the market, who moves money in ways that help community. Because that, for the Calvinists, that was what they were believing, is that money is to do good. But what this theologian talked about was the fact that We have a situation now where it's no longer the invisible hand of God over the market. It's the invisible hand of the market over society. And the market has actually become God in our world. So that whatever the market says is good. Whatever the market does becomes the definition of what is good. And that's why Occupy Wall Street happened. Because... It's not good. Now, what I love about SOCAP is that we've actually created this space for people who do want to leverage the market, leverage money to do good. So actually, the same time, there was this article that that was um, uh, published in Wall Street Journal, same, actually like a month before I was on that show. And it it was also talking about, you know, the economic downturn. And this guy, Anil Karnani, which some of you might be familiar with, he's a professor, um, I believe, at University of Michigan University, and he is an economist, and he talked about this. He said, the fact is that while companies sometimes can do well by doing good, more often they can't, because in most cases, doing what's best for society means sacrificing profits. Now, in a capital, like in pure capitalism, capitalism is about profit. It is about making money. Not according to Adam Smith, but that's what it's become, right? So one of the things he went on to say, now you don't have to read this whole thing, I'll explain it, because actually I got on the phone with him and I I talked to him about this. What he said was, the, the problem is, is that for big corporations who want to do good, you have this, this conundrum. They might want to do good, and they actually have that triple bottom line, But the problem is is that the minute that they start losing profit, that's when they're actually risking their job because they're actually going against the very reason why they were hired, which is what? To make money for the shareholder. That's the reason why they were hired. So in the same same, uh, article and then also on the call with him, he began to talk about, so, so then how do we do it? You know, what is it that we actually... How can we do good with our money? I'm just going to go boom, just like that. There you go. There you go. There you go. And there you go. Um, And I would say that the reason why, and I've, you know, in in my conversation with him, the reason why I think faith is so important is because doing good with money requires faith, actually. It requires faith. The role of faith communities in, in vibrant communities is we actually play a key role, I believe. And that key role is to guide the polis, the community, the people, toward the common good so that the people are empowered to do two things. One, to determine what vibrancy looks like in their community and to invest in the companies that cultivate the common good through two two ways, shareholder investment and disciplined consumption of products and services. And then the second way that vibrant, that, that faith contributes is to set limits, to guide the, the polis, the community, the people, to set limits on the amount of damage that companies are able to do through regulation. So government actually plays a role. In, our, in the faith community, our goal, our job, one of our key roles in this is to actually help to move congregations, to move um, the, the people that are in our communities toward the common good. So to just to, because I know there are people either who are listening on simulcast or in this room who are saying, Lisa, you hate money. No, I don't. No. No, I don't hate money. <laughs> you That's hate it. profit. <laughs> You're a socialist. No, You're... I'm not a socialist. No, no, no. Okay, so here's the deal. I actually, believe me, I actually really love money. I don't have a whole lot of it, but I love it. And here's the thing. Money is just money. Money is paper. Money is coins. Money has the meaning that we attribute to it. Money has the power that we give it 
actually. Uh -huh. And I think we found that in economic downturn. I had a lot of friends who lost a lot of money, but we realized, wow, you know, we can actually move into this bartering system. When folks don't have money, they can begin to share stuff and, and trade. And, and so money really only has the power that we give it. So it useful. is not inherently good or bad. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so, oh, no, back one. So going forward, now, I'm actually speaking from a Christian perspective. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Whoa! Can we get that back? So I'm speaking from a Christian perspective, but I'm not the only, Christians are not the only faith people in the world. We know that. We live in a pluralistic society. But as a pluralistic society, I imagine you're going to allow me to be a Christian for a minute. Can we do that? Can, can you do that? Okay, great. Thank you. So I don't know what happened to this, but oh, I lost my slides. Okay, it's coming. All right, great. Thank you. So there we go. So we have four ways, four pillars of the biblical, of, of God's economy in the Bible. Because, you know, there was actually a time when in the scripture, and we're talking about Hebrew Bible, which is followed by three, the three Abrahamic faiths. Um, you know, we have this point where God actually established a government. And we actually have principles that we can learn about what it looks like to build vibrant communities through money <coughs> In that, um, through those stories, and there's, there's these four pillars that I want to bring out. One is the pillar of the gleaning laws. The gleaning laws um, were these laws on the books that actually told people who had farms, and you, you have to actually create space that you don't reap. You're not going to be able to reap this. You have to leave this for the people who are passing through, the immigrants within your borders, and the poor, and the orphan, and the widow. Then you have the sabbatical year. Oh, it's coming back. Yay. Okay, I think it's coming back. Well, we'll see. So then you have, then you have the, the Sabbath. Now, people look at me like, the Sabbath? Like the Sabbath was actually um, an economic pillar? Yes, it was. Because there's an economic impact to requiring everyone, everyone, including the land, to rest once a week. Even the land was, even the slaves were required to rest. That meant that there was some level of growth that people were not, businesses were not going to be able to accomplish. And then you up that, now you, that's like every seven days, you up that to every seven years, you have the sabbatical year. And the sabbatical year, you have this situation where not only does everybody get to rest, but they rest the entire year. Can you imagine in America if we actually, I'm not saying we should do this, but can you imagine if we established an economy where every, every seven years, everybody takes the year off, including the oxen? Um, hello? Like, you know what I mean? And debts are forgiven in the sabbatical year. So all debts are forgiven. And if you're a slave, you get set free, right? That was how it was established. Then you up that to the year of Jubilee every seven, seven years, right? So every 49, and you get this incredible pillar, which you know, we don't really know if they ever actually did it because this requires serious faith. Not only do you get to take the whole year off, not only does all the debts get forgiven, not only are the slaves set free, but... If you lost your land at some point in the last 49 years, this is the year when the reset button is, is set. And all the land goes back to the original deed owners of the people who entered the land and got that plot when they first entered the land of Israel. What's the impact of that? What's the impact of this structure? First of all, and again, I'm saying, I'm not saying we should do this, right? I don't know if we could. I don't know that we actually have the faith to do this. But I think that there are four principles that we can actually glean from this. One, that vibrant communities require disciplined commerce. Disciplined commerce. So in order to take the year off every seven years, you had to be saving enough over the six years before in order to make it through that seventh year. You need to be thinking ahead. You need to be planning for that. Also, business requires faith. Here's the deal. We could never go to a place where we have, in that kind of society, you could never get to the place where, where empire, businesses build to the place where they become empires. 
because you would always be forgiving debt. You would always be returning land back to the original deed owners, and people would always be taking the day off or the year off. So, in other words, the purposes of God would never have to compete with the purposes of business or profit. And then finally, there is a critical role that regulation can play in the building of vibrant communities because regulation protects people, and people are essential to vibrant communities. So, That's it. so thank you, Lisa. You go back one. Yeah, absolutely. So I want if folks could get questions ready, and I want to get some some stories from everybody, real <laughs> quick stories. But and, and then we'll we'll do some questions. But I think this slide um, is a really nice one to keep up. Um, so, Andrea, and my all of my pushing on you, um, and thank you for putting up with me. Um, what we didn't hear was. Um, Give us, give us a real story of, of social justice investment in your work. Right. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a shift from, uh, the, from what you just heard. It will be the concreteness of, uh, of investing. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that has been touted as one of the most successful impact investments out there. It has to do with uh, small communities in southern Mexico on indigenous land. The investment in this case was a wind project mm -hmm. that was financed by a group of uh, European uh, investors, largely Spanish and French energy developers, right? That actually produced excellent profits. You say, what's not to love? That's what impact investing is all about. Renewable energy on indigenous lands that actually produces profit. What's the profit? And I went to visit that community a few years later when they supposedly have been such a great uh, example of impact investing, and the communities were in worse shape than they were before the investment came in. They had lost their land because they had been largely swindled into giving it up for 50 cents an acre. For this wind farm. For this wind farm, with the backing of the, of the Mexican government. <laughs> this is on the, for those who know uh, Mexico well, it's in the state of Oaxaca on the isthmus of Tehuantepec, so deep southern Mexico. Um, they were protesting against this, putting up barricades. There were fights in the streets. And you say, wait a second, is this really the kind of face of impact investing that we want to see? Is this the promise of impact investing? Proceeds and profits flowing back to Europe. Folks in the U.S. feeling great about this because it is green renewable energy and because we've helped these poor communities. And the community itself being in worse shape because they lost some of their land. Many of them went to work on producing this farm, saying, oh, you know, wind energy produces X number of jobs. And it was six months of sc screwing turbines. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, thank you very much. We're done with that. And all the maintenance will be done coming in from overseas. And really having a large disruption environmentally, for example. Apparently, a lot of them rely on shrimp farming as a way of, uh, of sustaining their income. And the sexual health of shrimp is affected by wind turbines. They just don't <laughs> quite, you know, get amongst it as much when, when there are wind turbines around. There's got to be so, a joke there, but I'm not going to so, get it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. So you say, okay, how would these have looked differently with the community engagement. If the community yeah. had been involved in the design, in the governance, in the ownership of this. In this case, we know what it would have looked like because there is a great entity called Grupo Yansa, uh, the Yansa group, uh, led by Sergio Oseransky, uh, a wind development expert that says, wait a second, these folks have most of what they need in order to put together a really fabulous project that will benefit all those things that you've said before, you know, the environment, this and that, but where the proceeds will really flow into the community, that will be governed by the community, and the project will fit their needs, right? So that's one of the first things that you need to ask, and this comes for me from earlier work that I did um, uh, with uh, indigenous communities in the Amazon during the bubble of uh, carbon credits when folks would come into the Amazon saying, hey, you know, we'll give you $100,000 if you don't chop down your trees. What do you mean? I, I, I'm not chopping down my trees. And anyways, the trees don't belong to me. And what I need is not $100,000, but a lot of other things. Hmm. So seeing this really big disconnect between folks that want to do well environmentally and socially and folks on the ground that say, no, sit down with us. Let's have a very different power relationship. Let's hear each other out and let's see what we do together. And as communities, 
most communities can bring a lot to the table themselves. So in the community that I was talking about in Oaxaca, in the, in the Yonsa group example, they would say, why don't we set it up, for example, so that a, a broad percentage of the proceeds from, this, uh, from these projects will remain in the community as a, form of, uh, as a series of trusts. So there will be a trust for the elderly because Mexican social security is now reaching this uh, largely farming communities. You get old, you don't farm, you die. Uh, a trust for youth so that youth can have entrepreneurship and remain in the community as, uh, as actors. And a trust for women because there is still a great undercapitalization of the, of the women's community there. Now here you see the difference between saying folks coming in from the outside saying, you guys are blessed with great wind, don't worry, we'll set up a bunch of turbines, thank you very much, yeah. and we'll toss something at you. Versus a community saying, we want the turbines to be here and here and here, even if they produce at the margin less wind because we don't want to mess with our shrimp or with our sacred sites or whatever it is. And we can still make a proceed. We don't need to knock it out of the park necessarily yep. because we're getting so much other value in terms of what is happening positively to our community. Got it. So one of the things I hear you saying is that the community needs an advocate. No, the community doesn't need an advocate. The community needs a space where it can make its voice heard. That's good. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Sean, give us a story, a business, not condo. She can tell her story later. That's a great story. It's a good story. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of the impact stories <clears throat> I've heard thus far, as so kept, you know, there's a lot of inter great international things going on, which, which is awesome. And I know, I know for us, we're domestic. We're here in the state. We're here in the community in Oakland and throughout the Bay Area. Um, a lot of our work in terms of the way we're moving capital um, is challenging the traditional notions of risk. And so we're moving uh, capital to folks who may not have the net worth you're used to seeing or the balance sheet you're used to seeing uh, or the track record that, that you're used to seeing, um, all of which we have learned are kind of irrelevant in a lot of respects if you're being uh, supported by the ecosystem we've, we've learned to be true uh, in our work with inner city advisors. So uh, I do have to talk about Conda because she's she's one of the, the entrepreneurs that we're most proud to be alongside and and i think uh, aside from impact hub oakland there's also back to the roots a great young company who had none of those things that i just mentioned uh that is actually our largest investment um and is now you know selling products across the world with the fun good jobs logo on their packaging uh -huh. whether it's a mushroom mini kit or an aqua farm um but i think the reason why it's important to mention uh conda is because that has changed the face of downtown Oakland. And so yeah. you can now say good jobs uh, start at Impact Hub Oakland and in downtown Oakland. And when you have a group of people raise a million plus in capital um, uh, in, a, in a way that is not happening, frankly, in, in Oakland or throughout the Bay Area for these types of ideas, these bold, innovative uh, ideas, uh, that not only have an impact of the direct staff per se, that, that, but that's not that's not the impact you're going to see coming out of Impact Hub Oakland. Yeah. Uh, you're going to see hundreds and, and likely thousands of entrepreneurs start businesses that end up creating jobs and good jobs in, in, in Oakland, not just downtown Oakland, but East Oakland and West Oakland. Um, and it's not just what that building stands for, it's who's standing behind it. And so yeah. I think for us, we were able to, to join that uh, story at a, at, a, at a pivotal time. Um, and they had done an amazing job of bringing a certain amount of capital to the table, um, but the market's not set up to bring all that capital right now. Yeah. Um, you can't answer questions that weren't true, like what's your track record, all these things that are just irrelevant um, to, a, to a bold idea like that. So yeah, for, for us, I think you know, we're proud about moving money to uh, the greatest need in terms of the capital stack, yep. uh, to, the, to, to people who are bought in and embedding on those people uh, who really believe in it, uh, who will have the highest growth potential in terms of creating good jobs. So um, it's a little bit of a, a one and a half stories there, but that's, that's no, my response. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, either from uh, your work in New York or, or elsewhere, tell, tell us a story, a quick story about sort of community vibrancy and where you've seen it. Wow, well I think the, I, I actually wanted to talk about two stories. One was in New York City. The other one is in Ferguson. That's I just came from last week. And 
Um, in New York City, uh, that's actually where I cut my teeth in organizing. I was there and I was organizing uh, for environmental justice was one of the things that my group, New York Faith and Justice, was working on. And uh, we organized a, a, a summit that brought together a cross-section of the city, not only people of faith, some of them were literally like Joe off the street came in and was yeah. a part of this thing, but also we had people from the mayor's office and legislators and we had advocates from various organizations that put together, together, the community put together a, a, a deliberative weekend where we went through and we asked the question, how can we have a food system? How can we develop a food system in New York City that serves the people who are affected by the five, I believe, five major areas in New York City that are officially, by the city, called food deserts. Places where you cannot find healthy food within a five mile radius. You couldn't walk to get healthy food. Mm -hmm. And so that, that collaborative effort that was at the heart of it was people of faith, of multiple faiths. And then at, um, it also engaged other sectors of the city. It ended up actually um, creating or pushing uh, the mayor to include in the 25-year plan for, uh, for sustainability a food system plan that was integrated into the entire rest of the plan. So we are extremely proud of that. Um, but part of that, one of the pieces that we fought for long term over the time that this actually led to was um, the, the working on food deserts by getting the FRESH program um, implemented in New York City, which has had its problems, but yeah. it also had made major impact because there were no supermarkets in many of these areas. And FRESH rezoned the areas in order to, in order to attract supermarkets that could bring in many more jobs than a, than a corner store. So you bring in jobs, you bring in, you're trying to do good, you bring in good jobs, no less, because they had to, you know, uh, because of regulation, they had to uh, reach a certain level of, um, of uh, sustainability for yep. the neighborhood. And the community had a say in how fresh was managed in their, in their neighborhood. Thank you. So with about eight minutes left, <laughs> do we have any questions from the audience? Anyone? Yeah. You want to use the mic? Oh, sure. Yep. Uh, whoa, that's a lot. When you're when you're measuring vibrancy, um, I know you've got that qualitative description that you guys opened with. Um, I would be interested to hear from the rest of the panel as well. Um, how do you how do you feel that vibrancy coming through in the work that you do, and 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 is that is that able to be brought out into an annual report, for example, to make a stronger case for? Uh, investment, for example, to, to tie it back into that profit. Yeah, so if vibrancy is the impact, how do you know if you got it? For, for us, it's something we track on a you know, weekly and monthly basis. So our balance sheet on the back of it has the path from jobs to good jobs. So there's, there's a, a patience there. There's a consideration of either end and either side of it. Um, I will say it's underdeveloped in terms of the market that we're presenting it to. So if you look at the fundraising um, hustle and grind that we're all familiar with. Uh, I think the measurement of vibrancy or the respective metrics we do care most about, uh, for us it's all around jobs and good jobs for home. Uh, that, that is uh, to be determined in terms of how it's being rewarded, right? So we uh, are still being asked questions first in terms of how do we, uh, what's our IRR going to be? Or what, what's our risk profile going to be? A lot of the traditional questions are kind of like unhelpful. You know, when you when you are talking to new funders, um, they're easy. We could talk about them all day, but you're dealing with people who don't understand it together. You know, and so I think we have to collectively which, help Which are each the other. questions that are uncomfortable? Uh, they're not uncomfortable. They're unhelpful. The, unhelpful. The, yeah, Thank the you. traditional the traditional kind of finance questions, yep. right? Because yep. if you're truly using capital as a tool to measure vibrancy in the, in, in the way you put it, um, you have to sort of pull off the traditional capital ways of being. Um, we're very fortunate to have very traditional capital minds um, kind of respond to a mission need. And so that takes, you know, as, as you mentioned, faith. It also takes courage to really be able to stand up in those difficult moments because the source of capital can have some, you know, fierce behavior behind it. So, yeah, uh, yeah we track that through now B Analytics uh, next, next month as I look at Atlanta on our team. Uh, we're implementing that. And, you know, there's some great tools there. But I think... Um, 
we're defining it as we go too. And, and our, sometimes our, our best voice of feedback are the entrepreneurs we're dealing with. Uh, but good jobs is a, is a journey. It's not something that happens right away. Yeah, just uh, to, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, uh, the metrics work is a lot of what we do and a lot of what we're asked to do at Transform Finance. And I will premise this by saying that in many cases, my initial reaction would be to push back on that and say, look, there are some things that we do as a matter of principle. So uh, we're asked to prove, for example, that community engagement leads to higher returns. I'm like, yes, it does, but it's also kind of, in many ways, the right thing to do. You know, if you're going to a community, you know, if not a mandate, at least some sort of uh, consultation or engagement would be good. Practically, though, you do have to measure these things. And uh, we try to get very much into the nitty-gritty of it, uh, going beyond what Gears or Iris does. Again, with this lens around uh, engagement, governance, ownership, um, where, the, where the profits remain, uh, so the extractiveness lens I was talking about, and really breaking it down to a number. You know, can you show positively that you have created more value that remained locally or not? And yes, you can do this. It's often painstaking work, but it's also work that attracts more impact investors and more people that are interested in this to it. They say, okay, I can really see the result of this. We recently talked with a, with a fund the, whose metric was job creation, right? Job creation is one of the most traditional and most contentious, perhaps. You know, there is a lot of evidence that uh, job creation is really job shifting often. And for them, a $20,000 a year job for a mother of two was considered to be impact, right? And you say, yikes, okay. Uh, admittedly, you know, if you're, if you're otherwise really dying of hunger, yes, that is a job. But, but is that a good job? Is that the kind of job that we want to create? Or are we creating, again, are we perpetuating a cycle of poverty? You know, if you have a $20,000 job with, as a single mother of two, chances are you're not going to get too far from that. Can we look at something a little bit more structural? Now, again, let's, let's be thorough about this. You know, it's not that that is a bad idea. It's that if we can choose where our investment dollars should go, my sense is that they ought to go more towards good jobs. And there's a lot of work being done around how to measure that, uh, and a lot of foundations are interested in that, finally, uh, than just saying, okay, these guys are creating some jobs. You know, Walmart is creating some jobs. Walmart is not an impact investor, uh, or sort of an, an impact investable kind of company, let's say. So can I also um, yeah. take a stab at this? I, so going back to Ferguson, I think that one of the reasons, for, if, if you have not heard what happened on August 9th, uh, this year, 2014, 18-year-old um, Michael Brown was shot um, at least six times and killed on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, um, and um, uh, in, in an apartment complex area, actually, um, that is not far from the place where you saw the marching happening every night on the news for a couple of weeks. Um, over the week that I was there, I heard lots of local leaders talk ex explicitly uh, and actually repent, talk about faith. I mean, these were most times in churches, meetings, community meetings in churches, where you had the leaders saying, forgive us, forgive us, because the number one thing that they were asking for forgiveness from the young people who were getting shot, right? Like, they were asking for forgiveness because they had abdicated leadership. They had abdicated the leadership over the youth, but also they had abdicated leadership by exercising their vote, which meant that now they had a governance structure and people who were governing them who were not like them, who did not understand them, and who were completely, who actually viewed their, their community as the other. Mm. Now, this didn't only have impact politically, it also had impact business-wise. When you go through Ferguson, one of the things that's, that's the truth there is that there are very few businesses that are actually owned by the people of Ferguson, particularly the black folk of, the, of, of Ferguson. Because if you watch the news, you know there's two Fergusons. There's white Ferguson and there's black Ferguson. And so what, what does vibrant community actually, or what would a measurement look like? I think that how I would measure it is I would, now this is talking theologically here, I would actually begin to ask the question, what does it look like for the people of Ferguson to rise up and live into fully the image of God within them. 
because theologically, the image of God is directly connected with the ability to exercise agency and leadership. And obviously, the people around them are not believing that they can exercise that leadership, but they've also internalized that. And what's happening now is the community is beginning to step into the image of God within themselves, exercise leadership, exercise agency, and begin to speak into the processes, yeah. political and business, coming into their community. So that, I mean, it, it's just a really lovely note to end on with a handful of seconds. Because, you know, Andrea, part of what you're talking about is, especially with this wind farm, uh, and I'm sure there are other examples, this idea of that community's agency in the context of an investment, their ability to control their destiny and even get to the place of ownership, which I'm sure is uniquely difficult, but obviously uniquely valuable as well. Similar with, with, with these businesses and giving them, giving them access to capital is a way of giving them the ability to step into themselves, to create, to have their own agency, to be able to have a destiny. Uh, and, and, and this, this image, um, of Ferguson is similar and, and, and wonderful. So thank you guys all very much uh, for your time. I hope this was useful. Thank you. Peace and love. Thank you.